Hi, my name is Randy Agert, and this is a brief introduction to pragmatics. A brief introduction to discourse representation theory. In the previous video, I made the argument, the case, for dynamic semantics. So a dynamic semantics would be a theory like discourse representation theory. In this video, we're going to go through most of those same examples and see how discourse representation theory could handle those examples of anaphora that a traditional logical approach would have troubles with. So the first attempt, this one is fairly straightforward to deal with in a semantic structure. So we've got again our propositions, um, we've got our quantifier phrase over here. This is the um, existential, it introduces the variable x, which is bound down here and here. Okay, so and we've got a C command operation, C command relationship here. So everything's fine in this sentence. Now let's look at how a discourse representation theory would deal with this. So I'm going to give a discourse representation structure for the same sentence. Now, let me explain a little bit about what these structures are. So the idea is that as a discourse continues, as it progresses, we're going to constantly update the discourse representation structure. So the idea is every participant in a discourse in their minds has a model of that discourse and that they are constantly building on to. And so this is just assuming this is kind of like the first sentence in the discourse, this is going to be our discourse representation structure up to that point in the discourse. At the top, we introduce our discourse reference. So in here, in this case, we introduce the variables x and y. And then down below, we give our propositions. This is the discourse knowledge that we've got. So the first thing that we're going to add is that this x is a man, right? So we do the predicate man and we apply it to that variable x. And the idea is that every sort of noun phrase has certain rules associated with it in terms of how you represent in a discourse representation structure. When we've got an indefinite, like a man, we introduce a brand new variable x, and then we give the information about it. So that is the predicate part here, man, and we say of x that it is a man. And then we give further information. So here we've got our predicate arrive, and we say arrived x. And then we notice we've got another noun phrase here, this time a pronoun. Pronouns work differently. Pronouns still introduce a new variable. So we've got the variable y that we introduce for this. However, the difference is that with a pronoun, we, our job is not to introduce a brand new variable or, or a brand new discourse referent. It's to link this referent to a, previously, a previous one. So in this case, the only previous one that we've got is x. So we're going to link y to x, y equals x. And now we say sat down. So remember, in the previous slide, we argued that a man, this existential x that was introduced by the um, by the indefinite, that it binded this variable down here. Well, we're approaching it differently. So the idea is in discourse representation theory that when you have a pronoun like this, it requires an inference. It requires us to figure out what is it most likely linked to. And in this case, you know, it's, a, it's kind of a no-brainer. It's got to be the only other possible uh, discourse reference, so it's going to be linked to x. But it still presumably requires some sort of inference. And notice that this sentence could be interpreted differently. This could be interpreted dictically, where that he refers to somebody in the context, so that he is some other person other than the man. But 
all things being equal, this is probably the more reasonable interpretation where y equals x. Okay, so that's our first attempt, and we can handle it pretty well, that sentence pretty well, either with traditional logic or with discourse representation structure. But wait, remember this example, we really can't handle very well in, discourse, in traditional logic. Um, because we want this x and this y to be bound by this x over here, or yeah, that x, sorry, that y we want to be bound to this x here, um, and that x we want to be bound to Patty, it doesn't really work that way, right? This is problematic. Um, these are unbound variables, meaning that this is an open proposition, all right, that's a problem for us. And we don't have a good solution for it in logic, except to say that these are treated differently than a bound variable like this one here, um, that somehow these are more constants. That would be really the only option in traditional logic. Well, in discourse representation structure, this is fairly straightforward. So we start with our first sentence, We've got Patty, and we're going to introduce, you know, so now we've got a, a proper name, and we'll introduce it with, again, a variable, but now we link it to Patty. So we say that that variable is Patty. And then we've got this indefinite a donut that links to this y up here, and we say that the donut is a new variable and we're introducing it so there is a donut essentially. And furthermore, we're saying that Patty X bought that donut. All right, so that's our first sentence. Then we've got our second sentence, she ate it, and we want she to be linked back to Patty to be co-referential with Patty, and we want it to be co-referential with the donut that she bought. All right, so now what we do is simply expand on our discourse representation structure. So now we add to our discourse reference Z and U, Z for that first pronoun and U for the second pronoun. And remember, when we introduce pronouns, we then look for something to link them to. So we've already got the first part. Now what we do is we say Z is linked back to X and U is linked back to Y and Z ate U. So in other words, now through that linking, we can assume that it's Patty who ate the donut. And again, although this seems pretty automatic in our minds, it still requires a certain amount of inferencing on the part of this, the recipient to realize that she refers back to Patty and it refers to donut. Although it's a very simple inferencing process, it's still inferencing. Okay, now, this is a little different, though, because now we're not introducing an existential, we're introducing a universal. And this is going to be a different sort of animal. And remember that we didn't like this, she ate it, coming right after it. So unlike in the previous one, Patty bought a donut, she ate it. That's good. This she can't link back to every girl. This it can't li link back to a donut. And remember, what we're assuming is that each girl bought a different donut. So for each girl, there is a donut. And we do that through these sorts of operations here, where we've got the universal all taking scope over our existential. So it's above it hierarchically. And so then this y is always defined with respect to the girl that we're looking for. And so we test this on each girl in our discourse domain. But notice, again, that we've got these free variables here, these unbound variables, that can't link easily back to that x and y that we introduced in the previous one. Um, so it makes sense in this case that this should not be a proper and appropriate, I should say, pragmatically. Now, let's look at it from a discourse representation structure and see if we can also capture that, why we don't want those pronouns to be linked. So again, we start with the first sentence, but now it's not an existential, it's a, a universal. And what we do is we start uh, by introducing a set. And so this 
substructure here introduces a set. So it's introducing the idea that there's a girl. But now what we do is we say, okay, we're going to look at every X in our domain that is a girl and test it on this. Or, and so in other words, we're applying it to this and saying that for every girl in our discourse domain, there is a donut and she bought that donut, right? Now, that's often captured in discourse representation structure using uh, a conditional, that is using if then. So one way of approaching it would be instead of using this every X, what you do is you've set up the same sort of thing, but you say if X is a girl, then there is a donut and X bought that donut. That's another way of approaching it. I prefer this method because that conditional method can't capture other sorts of quantifiers. It can't capture quantifiers like many or most or several, whereas this approach captures that quite nicely. So um, we would just substitute a different sort of um, quantifier in here. And what we would say is that there are different rules for how you verify a discourse representation structure like this, depending on what variable is in there. So we don't need to go into that in great detail, but I want to just explain why I prefer this particular way of representing every. Okay, now that's our first sentence, every girl bought a donut. Notice that neither the X nor the Y are introduced up here in our discourse domain. They're introduced in these sub-discourse representation structures. All right, now let's look at the next sentence. She ate it, which we agreed is pragmatically inappropriate. Now we've got pronouns. So again, we introduce our variable Z and U, but the problem is that we really can't do that linking that we wanted to do before, right? So we can't link that Z to the X and we can't link the U to the Y. The reason has to do with accessibility. This is part of the theory of discourse representation structures is that substructures are not accessible from above. In other words, there's this kind of asymmetry in accessibility that these substructures can, ac can access uh, discourse reference from, that are above them, but not below them. And likewise, structures on the right can access variables that are on the left. So this discourse structure here can access the X that's introduced in the previous one because it's on the left. But it couldn't, but the X on this or this structure here couldn't access anything in this structure to the right. And these structures could access anything above them, but not anything below them. Um, and, and likewise, they can't access anything that was introduced after they were introduced in the structure. So there's an accessibility issue here. And I'm going to go off on a digression on accessibility, I want to kind of illustrate the, the motivation for this. So let's think about negation. Because with this sentence here, oops, with this sentence here, we have this existential, a donut. But the problem is that donut really isn't accessible to us in the larger discourse. And I'll demonstrate what I mean by this. So we have our discourse representation structure like this. We've got Patty. We're going to introduce her at the higher level. So we've got our X representing Patty. And then we're going to have our negation. So this symbol here is just a negation symbol and a substructure. And this substructure represents what we're negating. And the donut is within that substructure. So it's introduced in the substructure. And what we're saying is in this substructure, Patty ate a donut, and then we're negating it. So we're saying it's not the case the, that there is a donut the Patty ate. And notice that, again, testing our intuitions on us, it doesn't make much sense to follow Patty didn't eat a donut with it was delicious, right? That it doesn't make any sense here. You're not going to link it back to the donut that doesn't exist, that she didn't eat, because there is no such donut. And discourse representation theory captures that nicely. It shows us that anything down here is inaccessible from above. So we can't then follow it 
with it was delicious because the it would be here in this larger discourse stru structure, and we would have to introduce the variable for y up here, say z, and then we would try to link the z to the y, but we don't have access to the y. This can also capture certain intuitions, for example, about hypotheticals. So in a discourse, if you introduce a hypothetical, like a hypothetical writer and a hypothetical reader, and you go off on this hypothetical for a while, once you leave the hypothetical, that reader and that writer that you've been discussing, say, for the past paragraph, they're no longer accessible. You can't talk about those hypotheticals any longer. So that captures that same idea that we're in a sense bracketing a hypothetical off in a sub discourse representation structure. Okay, now this is the hold the fort example. This is the sort of example, the donkey anaphora as we call them, that you simply can't deal with in a traditional logic. So remember, this was our attempt um, where we introduce the universal, capturing this relative clause here in this part here. So we introduce a donut as a sub part of this quantifier phrase. So what we're saying is that we're restricting our quantifier phrase to girls who have bought donuts, right? Or a donut rather. So for each girl, there is a donut that she bought. And then we're saying that each of those girls who bought a donut ate the donut that she bought, right? So this Y down here is supposed to be the same Y that was introduced here. But again, the problem is that we don't have any way of binding the, this Y down here. It's an unbound variable. Okay, so that's our problem. Now let's look at how discourse representation structure is going to deal with this. It's actually pretty easy in discourse representation structure. First of all, we want to introduce our set. So we've got X is girl, right? So for, you know, we're introducing the set of girls who bought a donut, right? And then we're saying for every X, where X is a girl, who bought a donut, she ate that donut. And notice that that X here is, can access the X that was introduced up here because it's on the right. And this Y can be accessed here again because this part is on the right, this part is on the left. So you can access things this direction, you can't access things this direction. Okay, so that's it, that's our, representation of it, it captures the idea that none of this is going to be accessible after the fact, right? That once we leave these sub substructures, we can't talk about she meaning every girl or it meaning the donut that she bought and ate. Okay, so those pronouns, that pronoun there, and actually this pronoun here as well, are only represented in substructures. There's no real discourse domain, discourse reference up here in the larger structure. All right, so in sum, standard quantifier logic can't fully account for natural language anaphora. Discourse representation theory, on the other hand, accounts for it nicely.